Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, August 11th, and even though we've really completed our gospel in the stars, we're looking at another sign in the heavens or in the sky. We're looking at the rainbow. And when we look at the rainbow, we're lo really looking at what God says is his bow. That's the way he puts it in our first reference. Last time I gave you homework, I said, go look up. There's four times in scripture that the rainbow is mentioned. If you did your homework, you know where the first one was. If you didn't, no worries. <laughs> I'll fill you in. Our first one is going to be in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 13. It's in Bereshit. It didn't take God long to bring it out in the course of human history um, and make it relevant in the lives of the people, but yet the bow was there before that. But let me back up and tell you just a little bit prior to that, okay? I believe in, and yes, you all know I have a love for rainbows. God's made them very meaningful in my life, that I try to approach this by scripture, not by emotion. But I do believe that the rainbow is a gift from God because he says it in that way. When we, well, let's look at Genesis 9, 13 while I'm introducing you to it. He said, and if you don't know Genesis 9, this is after the, the flood, Noah's flood, and uh, Noah has made a sacrifice to the Lord, and then the rainbow is what is seen. God says at that point, and this is God speaking, I have set my rainbow in the cloud. It shall serve as a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. In our Hebrew, God says, basically, I've gifted my bow. That's the way the Hebrew reads when you get into the, the Hebrew wording. Genesis, Genesis 9, 13. Yeah, I got it, but what did oh. you say that uh, in Hebrew it says what? He says, I gift my gift. bow, gift. I'm giving you. Today we've got somebody in our room, I won't name his name since it goes out on Zoom all over the world, <laughs> but he's having a birthday. Birthdays often when we get a gift. Well, this was a gift given to all of mankind even though it wasn't their birthday. But this was God reestablishing a covenant with Noah and his family, but notice he didn't say it's just to Noah and the family, even though they're the only ones alive at this point. He said it's a covenant between himself, God, and the earth. Obviously it's going to go past Noah and his family. Well, we're part of that earth, so it's, it's a covenant that God's given down to us today. I like to say that the rainbow is colorful gift wrap and that God wrapped up this special gift for us but when we unwrap it it reveals God's love to us and that's what he was wanting to gift to us is his love. Um, was that the very first rainbow or was there rainbows in the Garden of Eden? I believe that the rainbow was prior to this that he didn't create the rainbow at this point. I believe it, it really, it's almost as if you could say the rainbow was part of God, it's his insignia, his stamp, however you want to put it, but as we see it later in scripture, we're going to see it's around the throne, around the one sitting on the throne, so I believe it is, it's existed far longer than just in relation to... So even before he created the earth? I think, even before he created the earth, I think so. I think so. I don't know this for a fact. We don't have that kind of information. But again, he doesn't use the words like he does in, in Genesis uh, where he creates. He doesn't say that he's creating this bow. He's gifting his bow. I gift you my bow is, is how he's saying it. Mine means he's claiming ownership. This is something that's mine. I can't gift you something that's not mine. I can, I can ask somebody else, Roger, give Pam something. But if I'm going to do it myself and it's something that belongs to me, I can say, I gift you my whatever. Well, God gifted his bow. Okay, so what he did basically is he wrote to us um, his promise. He wrote his promise to us. More promise than one, but we're going to give it overall. He wrote his promise to us with love and he signed it with a rainbow. Okay, does that work? I like that, all right? And God speaks as loudly as that rainbow. We're going to see that rainbow communicates. It communicates very loudly his love as we unwrap our gift and see. Another way to explain it that's in line with what our rabbis, especially the rabbis of old have said, is that the rainbow is the glory of the Lord. Now we know that the glory of God is the Lord. 
His glory is emanated through the rainbow. Why are we connecting it to the Lord? Stay tuned and you'll see why we connect it specifically with him. But in ancient times, the rabbis wouldn't even look at the rainbow because they feared that either one, they'd be blinded by the divine glory because it was so glorious being part of the, of the Lord, or they would desecrate it because they weren't holy enough. So they would shield their eyes from it, which I, I think is sad that they missed out on the beauty and what that rainbow represents. When we move from Genesis 9.13, the next time we see it in Scripture is all the way to Ezekiel. Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 1. And when we see, whoops, when we see Ezekiel chapter 1, I think it helps us understand why someone said, or more than one, said that the rainbow is the glory of the Lord. Ezekiel has some wow dreams or visions. I should call them visions because he's seeing them. Um, that are amazing. You can read that in his book. But in chapter 1 and verse 28 is where the rainbow is mentioned. So since that's what we're teaching about today, that's where I'm going to focus in. When I read in Hezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 28, I read, Like the appearance of the rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the surrounding radiance. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard a voice speaking. The voice goes on, you know the voice very much as the voice of the Lord. So when Hezekiel saw this glory, he described it like a rainbow on a rainy day and said that's like the glory of the Lord. So that's how they get that idea. They drew it from what Ezekiel himself was saying. Someone commented on Ezekiel and said the rainbow is multi-splendored colors. We know that. Splendid colors, multicolors of the rainbow that refracts, and we'll explain what refracting means in a moment, from the blazing light of God's glory. So what I'm trying to take you to is what starts a rainbow? God's glory. Then it comes refracted out and becomes the rainbow that we see. So let me explain to you scientifically how we get a rainbow. Now, I'm not a scientist, so I'll give you the best I can. Um, but if you want to understand better, go read the science books, okay? <laughs> Sunlight enters into a raindrop. When that happens, it's refracted. That means that that light that entered that raindrop gets bent. It goes from being a straight line to being bent. Okay? Now, some of the light is reflected back into that raindrop again, and when it leaves the raindrop again, it's refracted again, and it, it exits in a, another color, so to speak. So you have multicolors coming in and going out. And depending on the length, depends on what the colors are that you see. The different wavelengths are the different colors. So if you look at a rainbow, you're always going to see red is the largest and violet hues are the smallest. It's always that way in the way the light comes in, gets refracted, goes out, comes in, gets refracted, and goes out. It gets bent more, it's going to be your lower colors, and when it's bent less, it's going to be the higher colors. But you'll never see a, a rainbow from nature, from God. You'll never see it mixed up colors. They're always the same. Now, it's interesting, and I can't explain because I, I'm not scientific enough, but the double rainbow will reverse. When you see two at once, you will see the colors reverse, but not mixed up. But you do see them reversed again. It has something to do with the way it's being refracted and the wavelengths that it's on. But the longer the wavelength, the, the less bent we get red. The shorter the wavelength and the more bent we get the violet colors. Um, and we have to realize that that light that's hitting the water droplets or the raindrops that's being refracted, that's what's being reflected into um, the observer's eye. So when you're seeing a rainbow, you're seeing that light being refracted, you're seeing all that happen. Of course, you don't see it in this breakdown, you see the results. But you're seeing a rainbow because it's gone into your eyes. You are the one observing it. What that means is you and I will stand next to each other and look at a rainbow in the sky and say, wow, look at that gorgeous rainbow. And we all agree. But we're not seeing the same rainbow. 
because the way the light and the sun, I mean, the sun is the light, the light and the raindrop comes to my eye is what makes the rainbow I see. So when it comes to somebody's eye over here, it's actually a different rainbow. And when somebody over there sees it, they're seeing a different rainbow. So when my family calls me up and says, quick, go outside and look, we see a rainbow in the east in the sky or wherever they're seeing, we'll both say, oh yeah, I see it. But we're not actually seeing the same rainbow because it has to line up with your eye. So you're seeing your very own personal rainbow. Wow. Yeah. Wait till I get to the end of the lesson and tell you what I do with that. Uh, we'll, we'll call it a pearl, a gem of a pearl, <laughs> <laughs> at least in my mind. Anyway, <clears throat> if we could get up high enough, if we could go to a mountaintop or get in a plane real quick, the rainbow that we are seeing actually is a complete circle. We just don't get to see the bottom half because it's too low in the sky and we're too low also. So an actual rainbow is 100% round. Um, it's like a ball. Circle. A circle. It's like a circle. A circle. Okay? It's like a circle. Because the other part's faded out. Because we're not lined up right, we're too low. If we could get up high and look down at it, okay. we would see it. You're not lined up right. We're not lined up right. The angle has to be a constant angle. And the only thing in geometry that gives a constant angle that would do this is the circle. That's, that's the only thing that has it. Now, it's very interesting. Mission pilots, when they are flying, they see a rainbow, and they literally fly into that <coughs> rainbow, and they call it flying into the glory. That's the name that, that's been Is given. There, so airplanes fly into it. They can fly into a, a rainbow, flying yes. Into the glory. The, flying into the glory. Flying into the glory. Flying into the glory. And of course, the mission pilots are the ones saying it because they believe in the Lord and God's glory, and they feel like they're getting to fly right into His glory, just be surrounded with His glory. It's the way I feel that we're going to feel when we're in heaven, and we're, we're just surrounded, because wait till I give you my description. Okay, um, that's where I think that we will see also that we've come into the glory of the Lord. Not just what's what was left behind like Moshe saw, but we're into it in a, in a greater way. Okay, so again, does this fit God and his character? Yes, the circle fits perfectly. A circle has no beginning and no end. God has no beginning and no end. So this would be a great object lesson for us to see and understand the fullness of his glory, okay? Now, we only get to see half. What's God's point in that? I believe that he has a reason for that. When we see that half a bow, it appears like a bow, okay? It's hanging in space, but if we took it down and we put it like an archer would, it looks like the bow that you could shoot an arrow, doesn't it? You know, it's got that bent, okay, like the archer's bow. So this is where we're going next because we see that this is like a battle bow that's been hung in the clouds, okay? Does that take anyone back to our gospel in the stars? If it doesn't, let me remind you, and that's fine if it doesn't. I get it. I don't retain everything either. But when we studied Sagittarius, we studied... That was the one that looked part man and part horse, the Centaurus. He was coming up on the elliptical. We talked about how it said the elliptical was where the sun uh, goes through. And we said that he was rising with healing in his wings. Remember all of that? Okay, and that was Malchi, Malachi, chapter 4, and verse 2. What we said then is we saw him as an archer. He had the, the bow pulled, the arrow in it. And the arrow was aimed to take out Scorpio. Remember the scorpion? It was aimed right at the heart. Okay? So that's where we see the bow with the arrow. But when we see the bow, we're seeing an empty bow. We're not seeing a bow and arrow. When we see it in the clouds, in the, the sky, it's not Sagittarius's picture that we're looking at. Okay? We're seeing a bow as if Sagittarius shot the bow, the arrow, I'm sorry, shot the arrow, took out Scorpio, and hung 
his archer's bow up, okay? He hung it in the sky. That's what we're seeing when we see it. Remember in, in Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew word for that bow that we saw in the stars was the name that's given to a hunting bow, a battle bow. It's not meant to be anything other than that. It is meant to be something um, that does that they do do battle with. When we take it into the Greek language, it also means the iris and the eye. Again, a perfect circle that we're seeing is the, the same word that they use for rainbow. Soviet cosmonaut took that from outer space. Wow, how do we show the camera then and pass it around? Okay, he's got a picture that was taken from outer space. It's just gorgeous. Where's I don't know if it's going to show. But anyway, Roger's going to pass it around the room, and I'm going to go on with what I'm saying. Um, the Hebrew word that is used back in Genesis 9 when Noah refers to the, the rainbow is that same word that we're talking about, the archer's bow. It, it's a hard word in Hebrew. It's like in English I would spell it Q-E-S-H-E-T-H, -E -T -H, something like that. I'm not even sure how to say it in the Hebrew, but again, it does mean the archer's bow, the battle bow. What we are seeing is this is God's battle bow. Remember God said, I gifted you my bow, but he didn't give it to Noah and the people who follow to take it and do battle notice it's the empty. It's the bow that's hung on the cloud because the work's been done. You see, God shot that arrow. That arrow was to take out the enemy. The enemy is Satan. The enemy is sin. The enemy is death. God took that out for all of us. We don't have the full experience of that yet, but we know that is our future. When we went on studying the gospel in the stars and we got to Capricorn, called Capricornus back then, Capricorn today, that's where we found the arrow. Do you remember that? Yeah. Under Capricorn, we had the three small pictures that come under the big name. And the first one under Capricorn was Sagita, and that meant the arrow. It was a small one, it was only 18 stars but we saw that the stars and the meanings was the arrow of God sent forth. So now we have the bow that he's hung empty, and we have that the arrow has been shot long enough that it's separate from the bow. The work has been done. Remember, the Lord died for us, in essence, before the foundations of the earth. He claimed that victory before the foundations of the earth, before mankind was ever created, the plan had already been done. Just like we looked last week at the Lamb's Book of Life, and the names are in the Lamb's Book of Life, before the foundations of the world. Well, the bow was hung, the arrow was shot. We saw the results finally when we got to the end, all the way to Leo, where we saw Hydra, the, the serpent, cast into the lake of fire. We saw everything being done away with, sin, death, everything being done away with. So the rainbow is an empty arch. The bow has been shot. It was, I, I just said that, I keep doing that. <coughs> the bow was, the arrow was sent. The arrow was sent, shot, okay? I need a lesson in bows and arrows. <laughs> the, the, it, it's an empty arch that's the bow. And the arrow's been shot. God has gifted that bow that he shot that arrow for mankind. Remember Genesis 9:13. He covenanted with the earth. Once again, I see in that that God so loved the world. He didn't say he did it just for those who would receive. He so loved the world. That's why no one can stand before God and say, I couldn't, I didn't have a chance, you didn't make me where I could do it. No, God God made it. He, he died in the person of Yeshua Jesus for all. Okay, so... We, we see how it fits into our gospel in the stars, but we get a little fuller meaning of the rainbow when we uh, study it separate from our gospel in the stars. Um, and the arrow that was shot, one of the stars in it, was called destroying. You know, so it is destroying. It went out to destroy. It is interesting also to me, when we look at our geometrical shapes, we looked at the circle to say that's the only thing that's constant, that's a perfect picture of our God who is constant, no beginning, no end. Well, also in our geometrical shapes, 
when we look at how God refers to our salvation, I've told you before, it's called the perfect active tense. This is the point with the arrow that goes on forever. It happened at a point in time, but the results continue forever. When you see that in your mind, do you not see an arrow? To me, there's a picture of Sagita. There's our arrow that's been shot. God sent the bow, he shot, the arrow took out his enemy, and the results last forever. So I think it's a beautiful picture. Okay. Um, now, it's very interesting also in Scripture that we find that God is exacting justice, but he's bringing mercy along. Every time when we see the rainbow, it seems to be this way, that, that there is something like the flood. God had to bring that flood on the earth. He said he regretted he made man. He was going to do away with them and begin again, so to speak, with just Noah and his family because Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was righteous before the Lord in his standing. So when God is ready to exude that kind of justice, that that just deserves, that, that righteous wrath that, that is poured out, at that time he also is extending his mercy. The mercy we see in the rainbow telling us what God has done for us. How do I put that into something that means something to you today? I'll put it this way. God sometimes has to allow a tear in your eye to paint a rainbow in your sky. Sometimes there has to be some sort of either a pain or a judgment or a storm or a suffering, but he's going to send his mercy along with it. He's never going to just do the judgment without his mercy. We even saw that again when in the Gospel of the Stars, and I don't remember it right now, but it's popping back into my mind at the end under Leo. When he's coming to rule and reign, we saw once again, you know, he comes in that swift judgment to take out the Antichrist, that end, but we saw also the mercy that was surrounding it. And I, I can't pull it quite back, but go to your end notes of the class and I think you will find it. So we do see that also in Hezekiel, Ezekiel, where we left off with the rainbow, because when you study, he is talking about uh, the visions that, that he gives Ezekiel are very much judgment visions, that what's going to come on the people of Israel because they've turned their back on their God, they are going to go into captivity and into suffering, but yet God is saying in that, he's ex exuding his mercy. His mercy is that they, he will bring the people back. His mercy to us is we can and we are saved. That's that's his mercy. That's what he is um, bringing to us at the time that judgment also has to fall. He can't ever just wink at our sin, cover it up, push it under the rug, say, I won't look at it. No, he had to have judged it. It had to have been paid the price, which was the shed blood of Yeshua, but then it is cast away forever. The, the results go on forever. So the rainbow also stands as a sign and a witness of God's everlasting covenant with his people. What he said to Noah is true today. It'll be true all the way through time. Um, in, in Genesis, we saw it was after Noah made the sacrifice. After he, they came out of the ark, after he made the sacrifice, God met him because he showed his heart toward God. Um, God remembers the sacrificial work, and that's what I want to bring out from Noah offering that sacrifice, because that was in faith, looking down through the corridor of time, believing that there would be the time when the Lamb of God would be the ultimate sacrifice, would shed his blood for the removal of our sins, a permanent removal. God never forgets that sacrificial work, and so he put that into the colors that, de that denote the rainbow. And I'll take you through, through those colors and show you. Right away we start with our wide band, the widest, and I think that's important because it's like it's reaching out. That rainbow that Roger just showed us is reaching out, covering how much of the world, you know, that was huge, okay? Well, the top color that we see is red. Red immediately makes us think of blood. It immediately makes us think of the symbol of sacrifice. It's the blood. And when we get down to those violet blue hues in the end, the small that's inside, we know purple is royalty, blue is heavenly. So we see the lamb, that sacrifice, 
who in the opening is sacrificing, shedding his blood. By the time we get down to the end of the rainbow, we see him reigning as king over his kingdom. Okay, that's pretty cool. We're going to go through that whole gamut. So let me bring that out to you. In fact, let's start that right now. Um, sound effects not meant. <laughs> but uh, it happens. Okay, we said the red is representing the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus. That the blood has been spent for us. It's been shed for us. Red also represented was represented in scripture by the Sardius stone. S A R D I U S. The Sardius stone. S A R D I U S. That brings us to our third place that we see the rainbow mentioned in scripture. We're going all the way from Genesis to Hezekiel, and now we're taking a flying leap, and we're going all the way into the book of Revelation. Revelation 4 is the next time that we read of the rainbow. So we go through a lot in Scripture before we get there, but Revelation 4 is key, is it not? We're going to look at Revelation 4, verse 3. 4, verse 3 says, He who was sitting, and the, the one, let me back up so you know what I'm talking about. Um, yes. For is a heavenly scene. The door opened in heaven. Uh, John was told, come up here. I'll show you things that will take place after. He said immediately he was in the spirit. Behold, a throne was standing in heaven. That's verse 2. So no question where we are. We're in heaven. We're seeing a heavenly scene in this. Someone was sitting on that throne. Now verse 3. He who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. Okay, there's our red, our sardius, but notice the next phrase. And there was a rainbow around the throne. Now this rainbow says it was like an emerald in appearance. So it may have been all kinds of shades of green, if that's what it's meaning, that it just was exemplifying just the, the green color. It may be. Green is going to be the fourth color. It's going to um, touch earth, earth, Earth's number in scripture is four. Green reminds us of green grass, of the earth, you know, it, it fits. So it could be that that is what is being seen because the Lord is going to be showing us that he did this in his covenant with earth. Um, it does not mean that there are, th that there's only that one rainbow in heaven. I know there are many, there are many. And if there's one that's all the shades of green, I'll bet there's one that's all the shades of red and all the others too, besides the ones that we see that bring all the colors to us. And what's the list of all the colors and their meanings? I only got red and green yet. Well, you skip green. You're gonna keep with red. We're gonna go through them all. Oh, well, I okay. bet you're gonna get yellow. Nope, nope, I, I barely started. You're gonna get a whole lot of notes, oh, okay. <laughs> okay? Okay, so red we saw in scripture now is the sardius stone. It reminds us of the shed blood. Um, what else do I need to say? Maybe that's all I need to say. Okay, the Sardis stone being red is a picture of humility to death. This is Philippians 2, 5 to 8. Let's look at that. Philippians 2, 5 to 8. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. We read, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Messiah Yeshua. Okay, this is who he is. As he already existed in the form of God, he didn't consider equality with God to be something grass, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and becoming born in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. Okay, we just started with God, who has always existed, who is the most high God. We have Yeshua, uh, Messiah Yeshua, um, Christ Jesus. We have him equal with God, but he doesn't see that as something to be seized and held on to and, and has to be. He was willing to humble himself to let go of, in some way, the, he still, he was always fully God. So it's hard for me to say. He's fully God and he's fully man at the same time. But in becoming fully man, he chose to confine himself. Let me put it that way. Because God is not confined in a body. God is bigger than that body that we're confining Yeshua Jesus in. But he chose that. When he chose to slip into time and space, put on a face, 
he chose to, to limit himself into that body. That's a limit that God did not have, that he chose, okay? He humbled himself. He took on the form of not just the human. He didn't come as the greatest human on the face of this earth, get all the praise and all the glory and be the king of the whole earth. No, he came this time as the bondservant. What's a bondservant? One who serves his master. Yeshua, uh, Sha'al Paul referred to himself as a bondservant of the Lord time and time again. He chose to be. He was doing what he wanted to be when he served the Lord. So the Lord took on the form of a servant when he was born in the likeness of man. And since he was in the likeness of man, he humbled himself even more. Not just, you can come through. You can come through. I'm good. Okay. He, he humbled himself, not just confining himself and taking on human form and, and being able to understand or relate to all our human sufferings and everything that we feel, but he also humbled himself even further. We say it when we say he came to die. He humbled himself all the way down to the point of a death. And then at the death on a cross, which it was in, in our Hebrew, as cursed as any man that hangs on a tree. This was the lowest. This was the worst thing that could happen to you. It, it's the most humble he could be. He took the lowest form he could. He shed his blood. And he did it in mankind so that he could redeem mankind. Well, all of this is to be remembered in that Sardius stone. And that Sardius stone, when we find it in scripture, it's the first stone in the breastplate of the, the high priest when he wears the afad. The breastplate had 12 stones. The very first one was the Sardius stone. It represented Reuben. Reuben's name means behold a son. And in this case, I'm going to say, say behold the son and give it a capital S because we see that this son that's being pictured here in Isaiah 9, 6, Yeshaya chapter 9 and verse 6, a verse we're very familiar with. Isaiah 9, 6 says, and I want to make sure I do it right, but I know it well. For a Ruben child, for <laughs> no, Reuben Ruben means behold a son. Oh, and I'm saying it's behold the son, because <laughs> that makes us think of Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonder of a Counselor or Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. So we see that the son that was given has all kinds of names. These names tell us he's the character of God because he's very God himself. So the son that was, was brought into the world, the child was born. The child's the baby that was born. The son of God came into the world. He is the counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. If I had a whole other class, I would teach on those four and what those mean in the Hebrew and all that, that goes with it. It's a wow, because you're studying the names of God. It's just, it's a wow, okay? For all of you who are hot, there's my hair going back on. Okay, so it speaks very much to Sardis stone. The red speaks very much of his coming in humility, his coming unto death, that we might be brought up to him, that we will be exalted, okay? That we might be exalted. Now, as soon as we say that, we know that we're represented in that way by the 12th stone, the last stone in the, in the ephod on the high priest is the Jasper stone. That stood for the 12th son. Remember, Jacob had 12 sons. Anyone remember the last one's name? Yes, the baby was the baby. Benjamin, very good. Benjamin in our Hebrew, and that means in English, son of my right hand. Who's at the right hand We're of the father? Red. We're still on red. Who's, who is sitting on the right hand of the father? Christ. The son, Christ, yes. So this perfectly represents his, who he is now and who he will come back as in his second coming. That's his exaltation. 
When he comes back in that exaltation, this is Revelation 19, I think you're very much familiar with that. We, we see him exalted and it's interesting that this jasper stone stood for the glory of God and it stood for light in scripture. Let me give you just a quick example. We go to Exodus 28. I thought jasper was green. No, the jasper in scripture is um, more almost, it almost like a diamond almost. Like a mother of pearl? No, it was clearer than that. Um, almost like a white, clear as crystal, clear as crystal. That's the best way to put it. Yeah, clear, and that's why, yeah, we would think of the diamond. Okay, Exodus 28 and verse 3 says, You shall speak to the skillful people whom I've endowed with the spirit of wisdom, that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may serve me as priest. So the garments that he's wearing were given to them by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit orchestrated what they, they would wear. The garments that he had make, and he names in verse 4, and he mentions the ephod, the breast piece, okay, that we're looking at. Now drop down to verse 17, knowing where this comes from. Verse 17 says, You shall mount on it four rows of stones. The first shall be, and here it names the sardius stone as the ruby. Ruby red, sardius stone, they're synonymous, okay? So you start with the ruby, and then you get down to the fourth stone, which is jasper, okay? The, I mean, the fourth row, barrel, onyx, and the last one is jasper, set in gold, okay? So there's your, your two colors, your two stones, um, and okay, and I've read all of that. Okay, now, go with me to Isaiah 60, 19. Isaiah 60 and verse 19. Okay, Isaiah 60 and verse 19, we read, No longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor will the moon give you light for brightness, but you will have the Lord as an everlasting light and your God as your glory. So referring to God as glory and an everlasting light is in line with saying that the, the light or the glory is God and it's exemplified by the jasper stone, the one that today is clear as crystal, most like our diamond, that's, that's the closest we're gonna to get to, and in that is a picture of purity. He was pure. If he was not pure, he couldn't have died for us. So we, we stands for purity, it stands for the glory of God. That glory of God is so light and so bright that it's going to be the light of the whole of, of the new Jerusalem. Also very interesting with our rainbow, when you start a rainbow, if you take a prism, the prism you know reflects and you see rainbows all over. If you take and you spin it, it will look pure white, and then the colors will come out. You start with that that pure light is what you're starting with. So a rainbow has to be pure and white, pure and bright, pure and light, before the colors can be reflected out. I find that, again, a great picture of who our Lord is. She, he's showing you the stones on the ephod. Um, the sardius is number one, but the jasper, they, they didn't do well in my opinion. I wasn't gonna say anything, but they gave the diamond to Zebulon, and really, when you get into the Hebrew roots, the jasper should be the diamond. It should be more white in color, so. It's still interesting what he pulled up, what he's looking at. Okay, uh, that brings us now, remembering he's pure and light, white, exalted, the glory of God coming back in his glory is going to take us to our last mention of the rainbow in scripture. And that's obviously in the book of Revelation because we've been going in order with them. This time go to Revelation chapter 10. We were in four before when we saw the throne. This is Revelation 10, and this is verse 1. Verse 1 says, I saw another strong angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was on his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. I'm going to stop there for a moment, okay? It's a rainbow around his head, probably a full circle again that's being seen. But right away, and by the way, the word from the Greek that's translated here gives us our word halo. So the idea that he's got a halo, 
it's, it's, it's you know, the, the circle, the rainbow of glory that we're seeing, okay? Now, when we saw the rainbow in Genesis 9, and we know it's a picture of the Lord and his sacrificial work. That's called a Christological reference. What that means, big old fancy word, but what it means is it's a picture of the Lord before he took on human form and what he was going to do for us. When we look at Revelation 10.1, what we're looking at is that the book of destiny has been opened by the slain lamb. Remember when the lamb took the book out? He was the only one worthy that could open the book. That was um, chapter 5. Okay, so he's, he's able to open it because he, he's bought back the title deed to the earth. He did that by dying. He cut off Satan's curse. You know, Satan got the, the domain of earth when Adam and Eve handed it over to him by sin. He's purchased it back now by his shed blood. And now we're going to see that he is righteous to judge the earth, to judge the sin of the earth, to cast that out and bring his earth back into what he intended earth to be in the first place, to bring it into the glory that it should have been. When we see this, we see, you know, we're watching, we're, we're basically seeing Yeshua Jesus' salvation at work for us. We're seeing that even when he brings judgment on the world or on an individual, that right in the midst of that judgment is that um, what did I call it earlier? I said mercy. Is that mercy? We see his grace extended to us. We see when he's telling us about judgment, he's telling us how to escape the judgment. He's giving us the way to escape it. So again, all the way through when we look at the rainbow, we see it as a canopy of protection from the judgment that's meted out on those who are not under it. So if you're under his rainbow of protection, you're in a good place. Now, Genesis 9, they came through the flood. Ezekiel 1, it's penning judgment that's going to come from God. If you want a reference, look at later, look at chapter 3, verses 17 to 19, but keep reading in Ezekiel, and you'll read of all the judgment that's going to come on the people. In Revelation 4, you have the picture again of a holy and a transcendent God surrounded by his rainbow. This was the emerald rainbow around the throne. The heavenly scene is bearing witness of his grace and his love. We're going to see more about how that color fits in with that. But that's just prior. Chapter 4 is just prior to what starts in chapter 6, and that's the tribulation. So again, judgment coming, the grace is being shown. Judgment coming, the grace is being shown. Judgment came, the grace is shown. That's what we're seeing every time you see the rainbow. So when you get to chapter 10 here, you have the rainbow about his head. The earth is receiving the judgment, but here is the one who can spare the individual from this, the, at least the eternal judgment against their soul by, by salvation. Now, here's your controversy, and I cannot answer it. I'll tell you up front, okay? <laughs> Chapter 10 started out, I read to you in our English, what we get is, I saw another strong angel. With words like that, we immediately say, well, then that can't be the Lord because he's not just a strong angel. He's not another angel, so it doesn't fit the Lord. What we're unsure of is whether those words are an accurate description of what they were trying to say in the Greek. Because maybe what would have been better to have said was, I saw like a strong angel. We often see that. When we study Melchizedek, we see one who was like the Son of God. Controversy is out whether Melchizedek was a real person or whether he was a Christophany, Christ in human form before he took on human form. Here we've got the same question. I cannot define it for you and say it's absolutely an angel and not the Lord or it's absolutely the Lord and not an angel. What I can tell you is when I leave it in context and I read the rest of the description following it in verses, well, especially two and three and going into four, you have, um, he cries out with a loud voice, the seven peals of thunder utter their voices, then he hears a voice from heaven, right? All of this makes me think it's the Lord. It sounds like the Lord. Let me show you why, and by the way, the description in verse 1 also is similar to Revelation 1. And when you look at Revelation 1, you absolutely know Revelation 1 is the Lord. Let me show you that real fast. Hold on to 10 because we might come back 
at Revelation 1. I'm going to jump in. Um, the, the vision starts, uh, okay, it starts with verse 13. In the middle of lamp stands, I saw one like a son of man. Okay, here's that like word in there. Um, clothed in a robe, reaching to his feet, wrapped around the chest with a golden sash. 14, 15, it goes on and it gives quite a description of this one that's being seen. 15 says his feet were like burnished bronze when it's been heated to glow in a furnace and his voice was like the sound of many waters. Well, bronze in scripture is judgment. Who has been given the right to judge? Yeshua Jesus. God even said that he put judgment into the hands of, of Yeshua because he was of the earth. He was, he took on human form, so he has a right to judge humanity. It's not a God that's detached, that's judging, it's a God who is exactly what we are, who is judging. So when you see chapter one and you go on, you know it's the Lord there, and he's being seen in that action of judgment. Again, makes me think that Revelation 10 is also a description of the Lord and his judgment. But if it bothers you because of the first verse, and I'll tell you I'm not 100%, neither camp, it doesn't have to be. We still know that if, if nothing else, if this angel would have to be, in my mind, the highest ranking angel, and yes, we have rank, we have archangels, we have seraphim, we have cherubim, we have different angels. And we know that there's angels that, that protect a whole country. Michael, Michael, and Gavriel are in relation to Israel. We know that there are you know, and angels with far more power, those with far less. At the very least, if God gives something so personal as his bow, that's his insignia, that's everything we've been studying, and gives that picture to someone other than himself, then that must be someone who is so close to God. It's got to be the highest of the highest of the angels if it's not a picture of the Lord himself. I'll just say that and leave it with you to decide what you want. If you want scriptures that talk about that loud voice roaring and thundering, I'm going to give you a list of verses. If I go too fast, you can get them from me later. I'm not going to read them all now. I'll read one for you. So I'll start you with Isaiah 42, 13. Um, it just makes me think it is the Lord because this is how his voice is described in so many other scriptures. Isaiah, Yeshua, chapter 42, verse 13. The Lord will go out like a warrior. He will stir his zeal like a man of war. He will shout. Indeed, he will raise a war cry. He will prevail against his enemies. So the Lord shouts. The Lord has a war cry. The Lord has that war hoop, and he goes out in that power. We see him in that way. You'll read about it in Jeremiah 25, verses 30 and 31. You'll read about it in Hosea chapter 11 and verse 10. Joel chapter 3 and verse 16. Amos chapter 1 and verse 2. And then we even have things like Psalm 29. Let me take you to Psalm 29 real quick, where it talks about the Lord thundering. Psalm 29, I think we'll start with verse 3. The voice of the Lord is on the waters. The glory of uh, the God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful, majestic, breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon in pieces. Those were the tallest, most beautiful trees that was, were such strong wood and such a beautiful picture that they were used in the temple. They floated them downstream to get them into uh, Solomon's temple when it was built in all his glory. For his voice to shatter a tree, for his voice to be this majestic and this powerful, then compare that to Revelation 10. Okay, and it goes on, it tells you all what else. The, the verse nine at the end of this, it says, the voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth, strips the forest bare, and in his temple, everything says glory. I love it, glory because it's the glory of God that's being shown. It's glorious, glory, a lot. Okay, Job 37, four and five talks about his voice roaring and thundering. Psalm 18, verses seven and 13 and 14. And we saw Revelation four, let me take you to Revelation four or five. Many references you can look up on your own because I think they're easy to be understood. Revelation four, in verse 5, and we saw the, the rainbow around him in verse 3. 
verse 5 says, Out of the throne came flashes of lightning, sounds and peals of thunder. There were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. That represents the Holy Spirit in all of his work. So that obviously, we see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Again now, I'll leave it to you. I'll bring to you one other thought to just ponder on. And that is that God at one point in scripture lifts up his hand and swears by himself because there's no one greater he can swear by. When we lift up our hand, we put the other hand on the Bible and we swear by the Bible as because that's the strongest authority that we can swear by. Well, God didn't have anything he put his hand on. He was the, the strongest. And so we see him swear the oath in that way. So when you see in chapter 10, the swearing there also, it could be the same thought. We'll find out one day when we get home and we can ask. But if you want the lifting up of his hand, singing th that in scripture, look at Deuteronomy 32, verses 39 and 40. And Daniel 12, 7, when you look at Daniel 12, 7, put with it Hebrews 6, 13 for a fuller understanding. Let me do that one just because those two need to go together. Daniel 12 and verse 7. Daniel 12 and verse Oops, I did Daniel 7, sorry. Daniel, come on, let me in. Daniel 12 and verse 7. Daniel? Okay. And I heard the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the stream as he raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven, swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. And as soon as they finish smashing the power of the holy people, all these events will be completed. He was talking about the second half of the tribulation, and he looked up toward heaven and swore by himself. But this one who's standing on the banks of the, the stream, he is bigger than life. I think he's bigger than a normal angel. I think that this has to be the Lord himself in that description, along with Hebrews 6 and verse 13, where we read, For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear an oath by no one greater, he swore by himself. So here we have the proof. Sometimes God lifts up his hand and swears, but he's swearing by himself. Okay? Now, remember we said if you stay under the protection, if you're, it's like being under an umbrella. If you're holding an umbrella when it's raining, the water's on the outside. You stay dry for the most part. Okay, but if you step out from under your umbrella, you hold your umbrella over here, you're going to get wet. It's just... That, that's just the way it is. So, it, it, and it's also interesting to note, and if you Google rainbows, you'll see it's not always true, but very often in nature, under the rainbow is a little bit lighter right there than the rest of the sky around it. Just interesting, not always, not always, but it is an interesting uh, thought, okay? Now, uh, they don't know if it's actually lighter right there, or if the colors, more of the white is what's showing through that brings the lightness out of it. There's a point for me saying that, I'll tie that up in just a bit also. So let's look at those colors real quickly now. We know very clearly the red is the shed blood. I think I've done that well. Orange, which comes right under the red, belongs to the gold family. Gold in scripture speaks of deity, deity. It's God fully God and God fully man. He is both characters if I can use that word in quotes that leads us into deity. yellow deity deity yeah it leads us into yellow yellow is the sun the sun is the light of this world and the son of God is the light of the world the true light so of the world. Means the light of the world yes yes yeah so deity, write, deity. Write so quick when you're talking. sorry I need yeah. to slow down but I watch that clock Deity is, he's fully God and he's fully man, okay? He's God. Oh, fully man and fully Yeah, he's God the Son and he's the Son of Man oh. at the same time, okay? That's what deity means. When you say God is deity, that's what you're saying. Fully God, fully man. There well, I are... Had that, I had that up before that yes. I wrote it down earlier. Yes. So Good. write it down again. Sure. <laughs> sure. Because see there's cults out there, there's false religions out there that do that claim that Jesus is not God. No, he is always God and God in Jesus is fully man. He's not 
uh, figure. He is the real. Okay. So again, yellow, we picture the sun. The sun is the light of this world. And the sun, S-O-N, said, I am the light of the world. He is the true light. That's John 8, 12. I'm so the light of the yellow world. Now? That's yellow. Oh, yes. We passed orange. Now we're yes. yellow. And yellow is the sun. Sun stands for the light of the world. And John 8, 12, he declares that he is the light of the world. It starts out S U N. Yellow makes us think of sun, and that sun lights our world. But when we see it spiritually speaking in His work, He's now S O N, who is the light of the world. So the yellow, yellow is the sun, S O N. Or it's both. It, okay, yellow. You picture yellow. You're going to think of the sun that lights this world. Okay. Okay. But it's a picture of the S O N. Yeah, both. Yes, who both. says, I am the light of the world, John 8 12. Okay, then Yeshua spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This isn't just light, this is life. We know that's the abundant life that he gives us. Do you remember Malachi, Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2 when we talked about it when we were looking at Sagittarius, that he rises with healing in his wings? Let's look at that one again, looking at the sun part, okay? Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2, that for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness, and this is spelled S-U-M in scripture, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings, and then you go forth and you fall, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. Don't let it fully bother you that it's saying it S U N. God uses pictures all the way through Scripture. He calls himself the Lamb of God. He's not really a lamb, is he? He's not woolly and walking on all fours and going bad, but he's the Lamb of God. So when it says the Son of Righteousness here rises with healing in his wings, only God, Raphael, heals. The Son who heals, who's rising with the righteousness in his wings, is the S O N, even though in scripture it's pictured as the S U N. Yes, four two. Malachi four two. And yes, it's like a parable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now we're to green. Now you can write down green, Pam. Now it's green. Green is a color for earth. Earth is where Yeshua did his earthly ministry. It's the fourth color, and four in scripture stands for the number of earth. Now, it's very interesting that there is a rainbow flower and its nickname is Eye of Heaven, E-Y-E, -E, Eye of Heaven, Eye of Heaven. Just interesting. I just love the way these little tidbits all just fall in there, okay? The fourth stone. It's a flower for real? Yes, it is for real. Yeah, yeah. I, I have looked at it. I have toyed with trying to buy it and plant it because I would love to grow the Eye of Heaven. What's the four for again? You said four something. Four is number for earth. Oh, earth. Yeah. I and that. Jesus' earthly ministry. Okay. Okay. It's the fourth color in the rainbow. Oh, gosh. I think it's not uncommon, Dora. Um, I don't remember what stopped me now. I didn't do it recently. It was a while back. I don't. That might have just not followed through. The eye of heaven. The eye of heaven. Yes, that's his nickname, and you can you can Google it that way as the Eye of Heaven and see it'll come up with it. Okay, now the fourth stone in the high priest breastplate. Remember, we looked at the first Reuben, the whole the sun, and it was red. We looked at number twelve, jasper, and it's white like the clearest crystal, the purity of the Lord, and showing him coming exalted in glory because it's the stone that stands for glory, light, who is Jesus. The fourth stone in the breastplate is an emerald. It's green, I should say in the ephod, make it real clear. It's green, and it's also mentioned in the, the foundation of New Jerusalem, Revelation 21, 19, mentions this emerald color. Now, what we're seeing in that is the reminder of the covenant God made with earth. Remember Genesis 9? He said that he covenanted with earth, and the sign he gave was the rainbow. He promised he would never destroy this earth with a flood again. Covenant of the earth. Covenant of the earth. Genesis 9 following from, start with verse 13 on. 
he talks about how it's his bow, it's his sign, it's a sign of the covenant that he's making, God's making with the earth, okay? Now, he promised never to destroy it again by flood. He's done it twice, I believe, by flood. Once when it was Satan's domain, once when it was in Noah's day. Now he's saying, oh, I'm not going to do it that way ever again. So we do hear floods rising in places, but we never hear of a worldwide flood. And we know that's not how this world ends either, because we've read the final chapter. If you don't know what I mean, read Revelation 19, 20, through, read 19 to the end of the book. Okay. <laughs> now, number four stands for the fourth son. The fourth son is Judah. You call him Judah. And it means praise. There is praise in the midst of the rainbow. Praise. Praise to God. Praise in the midst of the rainbow. Why would there not be when you see the atoning work of the Lord that shows us who, that he is the son of God, that shows us that, that his glory and his life, that he's covenanted with earth and we go all the way through to where we're going to get to the end. Yeah, we stand in the middle of that praise. God's throne is surrounded by a rainbow. When we see God's throne surrounded by the rainbow, we also see the praise that's taking, um, that's happening, I'll put it that way, that's happening around the throne. Anyone think heaven's quiet? <laughs> I got news for you, and don't put it in any earplugs. It won't hurt your eardrums. Join in the heavenly choir. You've got all kinds of choruses singing praises all over heaven, simultaneously going off. The idea given is that one over here, praise the Lord, and it sends off an echo, 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 because everybody else, yes, praise the Lord, and they're looking at him and praising him for different reasons from different angles, and it's just all this praise being lifted up. Yes, Dora. Are we going to be singing in our language, like Spanish? Could be. <laughs> Could be. I have no idea. We have a heavenly language. Maybe we'll all sing in, in our heavenly language also, but I know God's a God of variety, and I know he doesn't like rubber stamps, so, you know, but how are you going to do it? You're going to be doing it perfectly. You're going to be doing it with a perfect body that can really praise it. You're not going to say, God, if I had a thousand times in a, a thousand years, maybe I could begin to get to the level of praising you that I'm wanting. No, I'll now be you're going to be doing it. Yes, there yeah. was quietness in heaven for one there was silence in heaven for one hour. And yeah. the joke went out. And that's that's why the only time they had quiet. Yeah, and it meant for a space of time. And that was standing in awe of the judgment that was going oh, to fall. Okay. The joke goes out that means there's no women in heaven because how can you have women in silence? Other than that, heaven is noisy, you're saying. Sorry to my own race. And other than that, heaven is noisy. And I think that was a very pregnant pause of quiet. That was a whoa. I think it about took everybody's breath away because here comes the wrath of God. Who can stand the day of judgment? Whoa. But not now. Now we're in the midst of the praise, the hallelujahs, the, the joy going off. Yes, Anne, you have a question? Unmute yourself so we can hear you. Which one? Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, Judah, is that, was that, what color was that with? Fourth sun, green. So that was with green and not emerald. Green is emerald. So green and emerald are the same yeah. one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry, didn't so, mean to confuse you. They're the same. <laughs> So this is all one under one color. This is all under green. This is the and whole you, earth. And the whole earth yeah. will be singing the praise of our God one day. I can hardly okay. wait. Yeah. Okay. I didn't get all of them either. I got the earth four. I got eye of heaven. Yes, fourth the, color yeah. of the rainbow. Fourth color. Fourth, fourth color of the rainbow. Fourth color. Fourth color. Fourth you color. got red, orange, yellow, green. Color. See, there's color. seven colors. I got teller. Okay, Anybody color. know why there's seven colors? This is a perfect number. Fourth color. Exactly. Okay. Perfect number, complete work, everything's here. Yes. And what was the last one? Okay, the fourth stone in the, in the ephod. And the fourth stone is emerald. If Roger pulled up again and they did it right, it's an emerald. And the fourth son, his name was Judah, 
Yuda, and that literally means praise. When you say Yuda Lael, you're saying praise to God in Hebrew, which means, which means praise. The throne is surrounded by a rainbow. The throne is surrounded by praise. He alone is worthy of praise, and that's why you, we would see the rainbow around his head, because he is the one alone who is worthy of praise. Okay? If you didn't, you can ask me later. We're going to move on because I don't want us to, to get skunked in the end, but I think we're doing okay. The next color we come to, the fifth color, is, is blue. I've lost a color somewhere. Is blue? Blue. I guess. You meant Jasper. You mentioned Jasper. Oh, okay. Just, that must be the seventh then because I'm coming up to the end and not having it. So it starts out with the Jasper. But uh, I don't know, we'll work that out. We'll get there, I'll get there in the end. Let's look at blue right now. Blue is a heavenly color. Blue makes heavenly. us think of heaven. It's he, a heavenly, heavenly, heavenly color. Sky. Blue is the color of heaven. Okay. We look up, we see blue skies, we say that's heaven. Okay, so blue makes us think of heaven. So you mean you that? If you want what the color so, means. Or is it not important? I like it because I'm doing what every color in the rainbow blue means. Is the color of heaven. Of heaven. He's lifted up to heaven. He will lift us up to heaven also. We see even the heavenly kingdom come down on earth, and that's when we will see him ruling as king. That takes us right away into the indigo, the violet colors, which is like our purple, and that hue that we see, the smallest that we see there, that's the royalty, that's the color of royalty. Purple, you picture the royal, king wearing the purple robe in scripture and, and, and so forth. The king with the crown on his head. He is king. He is victor. We can gain victory through his atoning work. So he brings us through his shed blood. He is the life that is brought into us. He meets us here on earth where we are human and earthly and need to be saved. And he lifts us up. Our heavenly home will be in heaven with him where we are royalty because we are the sons of God. We are his His sons and daughters, I'll put it that way. So we are even given crowns. We give our crowns to the Lord, but we see the royalty. So he gains victory. He brings us the victory all the way through. We see it in, in all of these, from beginning to end, in all of the colors. That his favorite color, the whole sky. The whole sky. a lot of area. So this color doesn't have a number, it just goes together with the blue? Right, I mean it, it's, you can separate, because I'll call it purple or, or violet, and then blue, and then we're back to, you know, now we're going backwards. Um, then we're back to uh, green, yellow, orange, red. Red, yellow, orange, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, the indigo. The seventh has to be the jasper, what we start with, the light that starts it all. So blue is it all. Blue is Israel's color too. Yeah, I love that. That's true. Yes. It fades in purple. Yes. I had clothes that were blue and I didn't And they wear, ended up fading And they purple. turned purple on you. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, it's in that. And even even when they try to do the flag of Israel, there's a, a brighter, more of a royal blue, and there's a deeper hue that almost becomes a purple. And as it fades, my dad's prayer shawl as it faded, it was definitely in the purple hue. Yeah, yeah. good point. So it does. And it's interesting that the, the blue that they need for the prayer shawls and all of that, they have found again. It comes from a snail that excretes this color. Long thought lost, and now they have found it again, and they're able to replicate it for the high priest's clothing that will be needed in the tribulation. Another sign, I think, of how close we are coming. And is it, was it blue or purple? It's, it's more blue, I think, but no, I, I don't know. I don't know whether it's more of the blue or leads to the purple. I don't know. Because you see, you know, yeah, you see it the turn. Claws turned in blue. Mine is purple because that's one of my favorite colors. But you know, the, the guys wear it as the blue stripe. Usually has the blue, but yes. yeah. But like I said, the Israeli flag, look at an old flag and you'll see it's fading to purple. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, now. Here's where we go with, with my theory. Remember when I'm telling you I've got scripture to back up and I give you scripture and I tell you, don't believe it because Rochelle said it, it's because the word of God says it. I cannot say to you the word of God says this, 
but I do think maybe the Lord gave me a little insight and I love it and if you don't that's fine you can reject it that's between you and yourself I'm not here to force myself on you but I'll tell you you can't steal my joy <laughs> okay we know in heaven let's go to Revelation 21 and we know we have a crystal sea okay what starts it all that that jasper color the white the prism that we're spinning the white the pure that goes out and other colors come from it okay uh, maybe it's 22 I think it's 22 so 21 tells us we're looking at the new heaven and the new earth yes 22 sorry go to the very last Revelation chapter 22 earth? Revelation 22 okay. yeah the very last chapter of our Bible starts out in verse 1 and says and he showed me a river of the water of life clear as crystal sounds like our jasper stone okay the river of life, water of life clear as crystal coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb goes down the middle of the street you've got trees on each side you've got the fruits that, that we're going to be eating for all of eternity and anybody who doesn't like fruit now no worries you will love the heavenly fruit you will not suffer any any missing of anything earthly in fact when I get a hold of something vine ripened oh it's so much better than what you get out of a grocery store no offense Emily <laughs> but it makes me think if this is that good what's the heavenly taste like this is just a little glimpse but what's the heavenly like but not to get sidetracked on the fruit we've got this crystal seat okay we've got clear as crystal we know that we're wearing white robes of righteousness right we've been clothed in the white robe of righteousness of the lord okay he's the light he's the glory of god he's lighting the whole you know we don't have a sun up there a yellow sun we've got him being the light so what's to keep that crystal sea from reflecting his light his light's reflected on the sea it gets refracted so that it breaks into those color wavelengths so that it splashes rainbows on our robes of righteousness. My robe does. I remember I showed you. Yes. The and window. You, I have a lot of crystals, so the sun will come through the window and the whole room is on Yeah, and you see rainbows all over. What's to keep that from being all over? Splashes of rainbows everywhere we look, reminding us of this that the Lord has done for us. Do you remember my acronym last week? I doubt it, and that's fine. <laughs> I said rainbow, R-A-I-M-B-O-W. Redemption's arch is never ending. Blessings of wonder. Say that again. <laughs> Redemption's arch is never ending. Blessings of wonder. Wow, because we can't begin to comprehend all the rainbow has. And if we see rainbows emanating from the throne, rain rainbows being refracted through the crystal sea, splashing on us, God loves color. Look at the colors he's put into our world, and we're told we've not seen color yet. My brother had the privilege years ago of seeing a laser show that, that they said they were going to shoot out a perfect red and a perfect blue. Now this is still man's doing, but when those lights shot out, it was like a streak across this, what they were looking at. My brother said the color just caught your breath. It was so, wow, you know, we can't contain it, we can't hold it, we're in a tainted earth. But those colors being, I, I just can't see God just leaving us, and I, I mean this, no disrespect, but just what? You know, I see the colors. I see that it would re reflect that, that it would remind us of eternity when we're looking at each other and looking at ourselves, that we're there because of the rainbow. We're there because of this gift that God wrapped up and gave us this bow of his love. It, it just, it fascinates me. There is such a thing as a lunar rainbow. The full moon is bright and it reflects, reflects the, the, the uh, raindrops just like the sun does but it's less bright so here i'm taking it to the heavenly the brighter that when we're in the true glory not just in sunshine from earth but in the light it would be amazing now how well you see that rainbow 
is how well you're lined up, okay? If you're lined up well, you see a great rainbow. If you're not lined up well, you see a more faint rainbow. But your best ones, when you're seeing your best ones, is because everything's coming together. The light, the raindrops, the refracting, the reflecting, you know, all of that's coming together. I'm going to say to you, how well you're in tune with the Lord is how well you're going to see the rainbow when you're in the midst of the storm. <laughs> no wonder I never see one. <laughs> yes, you will. In the Lord's power, you will. Because you need to have to see the rainbow. You need to have the sun behind you and the clouds in front of you. When you're in your storm and you think, God, where are you? The sun is behind you. And if you line up, you'll see that rainbow gloriously shining for you. Now, here's my... The sun behind the cloud before. The, the sun has to be behind you and the clouds in front of you to see the rainbow well. And I, I'll say it this way. When storm clouds fill your sky, God has his rainbow standing by. Okay? When your view is his, your perspective will change. And in essence, you will see him. And that's your rainbow because the rainbow is him. It's his gift. Now, remember when I said that I've got this theory and this theory is all the rainbows refracted on us. But here's part two of that theory, okay? Well, behind you is hardship. The sun is behind you. The it's sun is behind you. That means you're going through hardship. When you're, when you, all you can see is clouds. Yeah. You're in the hard place. But, but the but that's sun. That's in front of you or behind you. That's in front of you. That's all you can see in front of you is clouds. All you see clouds, is the storm. That's but God, the sun, is behind you. Behind you. Oh, he I is protecting you. <laughs> he is behind you. He is bringing you into position to see the rainbow come out of your storm. So, yeah. Yes, the Lord, the light of the world. When Ron was still commuting to Orange County, when I was right home one day, the rainbow actually came in the car, the whole car was filled. Wow, <laughs> now that's an experience I've never had. Hours. If you're not hearing her, she said when her husband was driving back from Orange County one day, the rainbow literally came down and landed in his car, so the whole car was filled with the, the colors of the rainbow. That was a touch of heaven. Yeah. That was wow. Okay, and here's part two of my theory. Those of you who are tall, never mind. But for us short people, us five foot people, okay? <laughs> How many times have you gone to see something only to see it through? I'll put it nicely, the head of somebody else, okay? <laughs> I was gonna call it that head. I'll leave my yeah. head out, okay? I went to an auditorium that seated over 3,000. There were maybe 400 there. I mean, we had this huge place and we're all kind of congregated, you know, one area and we're looking, well, we couldn't be looking down, we had to be looking up, but anyway, the stage is out there. Halfway through this presentation with literally 2,900 other seats this man could choose. He comes down to the row in front of where we're sitting and I'm in a long row and I'm in the middle so I can't just move easily. And Anne's laughing because she knows what's happening. He's wearing a cowboy hat to boot. <laughs> and he comes down and where does he stop? right in front of me and all i saw the rest of the evening was a cowboy hat in the man's back that's probably a 10-ton hat too it was a big one it was a big one and of course in my eyes it's even bigger you know it's a fish that got away but no it was big enough that i'm trying to see the rest of the evening now when we get home and we're in glory when you see a sea of people here on earth and we know there's more than that in heaven thank god and we're all told we're going to see Yeshua Jesus face to face. Well, I have news for you. You don't get a number and stand in line and you get your 15 seconds of face to face with the Lord. And oh, now you gotta go to the back line and wait and work your way up again to get to see the Lord in all his glory. No, we know we're going to see him face to face throughout eternity. Now, how am I going to see him face to face with no hat and no man <laughs> in front of me? And how is everybody else at the same time? Well, remember the rainbow that even though we all think we're seeing the same rainbow, we think we're having the same experience, 
We're saying, yeah, it's gorgeous, but we're each seeing our own rainbow. Are you beginning to get what I get? I think in some way, the Lord's reflecting, reflecting, whatever that word is, I can't say. His light into our eyes. We're going to each see just as good as I see my hand in front of my face right now. Is that not cool? You're going to have a private one-on-one -on -one audience with your Lord in the midst of the sea of heaven. <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. If I'm wrong, he's got something even better planned, I guarantee you, because I'm not going to see heaven through the back of somebody's head. <laughs> but there you go. God sends us showers. Those showers are showers of blessings. They turn into rainbows of joy when we're tuned in, when we've got the right outlook, when we're looking and realizing the sun is behind me, supporting me, carrying me, helping me guarding me you know there's no rear guard our rear guard is the lord and those storm clouds suddenly take on his glory that's what i'm talking about god's promise remind us no matter how fierce the storm is no matter how bad it can not knock out his power supply the light of the world knows no power failure plug into his rainbow plug into his light and see him in all his glory does god not speak as loudly as a rainbow is that rainbow in the sky not a reminder every time we see it i'm saved i'm saved i'm going to reflect his glory i'm going to be shining in his colors and i'm going to see him face to face and if that doesn't make your storm clouds go away then sorry folks but there ain't no hope for you because the arrow's been shot. Sin and death and all is done away with. This is our Lord. This is our victory. This is the canopy of love that he has put over us. The rainbow, when you look at it, it's God smiling. That's why it's upside down, because he's looking down smiling at us. <laughs> it's his smile on his people who he has redeemed. He indeed, I believe, wrote his promise to us with love and signed it with the rainbow, from the red to the purple. So I give you the rainbow. I even did it in time. We can open up to discussion or questions or whatnot, but I think that is a beautiful, beautiful picture for us of who our Lord is, what he has done, and a nice little bow on top of our gospel in the stars, because in the heavens, we see that bow hung. The work is done. And I say, hallelujah, praise the Lord. <laughs> Yes, sir. Well, I only have five in blue, and then do I get purple six and just jasper? jasper has seven. to be the seventh, you know, the starting, the finish jasper. of it, the jasper. It has because I'm looking for my seventh color, too, and I, I, I've missed it somewhere. But it, it has to be. These are our colors because there's no other color. You've got red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, and it starts like the prism. It starts when the light's reflected, so you're starting with Jasper. You're starting off with the light, the perfect, and all the other colors come out. And that's like the seventh color. I'm going to make you crazy. Okay. And ask you to, again, slowly give us the rank, because neither one of us got all of them. Okay, so <laughs> what they stand for? Yes. Okay, red is shed blood. Yes. No, 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 the redemptive arch. Oh, oh, my, my little acronym. Your dad is, yeah. Redemptive arch is... Yeah. Never ending. Okay, never ending. Yes. Bye. Shalom. <laughs> Blessings of wonder. Oh, okay. Now, you can come up with anything you want. That's what I came up with when I was working on it with the Lord and me together. Yeah. That's what I came up with. Redemptive. Redemptive. Redemptive Redemption's arch. arch. In the redemption arch, the arch that is our redemption. That's what I'm saying. Okay, if you say redemptive arch, that's fine. You just, the idea is we're redeemed. We're redeemed through this arch. So it's never ending and it's blessings and it's a wonder. Wow. I don't think I've scratched the surface yet of the rainbow. Part two in heaven at my home. Let's say a thousand years after we've been there, I'll teach you part two on the rainbow. <laughs> <laughs>
How's that? Okay, <laughs> everyone's welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, comments from the peanut gallery that's you Zoom. Yes, Rhonda. It says that the, the other two rainbow uh, colors were indigo and violet. Uh, well, right? Indigo and violet I have down as one color. One so, color. Yeah. Yeah, that's your your purple color. You know? Oh, that's purple. Yeah. See, well, purple. That's, that's six colors, right? Right, and that's why the jasper, the light that, that brings us the rainbow is considered the sun. Because you can't have the rainbow without that pure start, that light that sets <coughs> out, and the lights reflect, reflect it, re I never will get that word out, reflected in those colors. Okay? So, but it, so, so the uh, pur we have purple, then we have jasper? Yeah, or jasper's really at the start, whichever way you want to look at it. I guess because it's a full circle starting in with the jasper, because you have to start with the light. If you don't have light, you're not going to get a rainbow. You have to have the sun and the rain to get the rainbow. If you don't have the, the sun, you don't have the light, you can't have your rainbow. That's why a lunar bow is only less intense, but it still has the moonlight. You, you have no light, you have no rainbow. So that's why that has to be the seventh color. No rain, no rainbow. <laughs> no rain, no rainbow. Okay, do all the colors have the name of the suns? Because you only gave us the red for Ruben and then um, uh, the yeah. other one two for green. I, yeah, I don't think they all do. Okay. I don't think okay. they all do. Each, the 12 stones each stand for a sun, but some of them are very similar in colors, like other shades of a gold or other shades of a green, you know, so, yeah, so no. Um, well, I don't I think I've ever seen anything. Yeah, no, no. I would love to give you them all, but like the, the purple, the royalty would have to be the Lord himself, not one of the sons, you know. Um, I mean, the closest you can get to that would be Judah again, but he's the fourth and he's the emerald, he's the green, because he's he's the, where the kingly line comes from. So yeah, you can't get all the sons in all of them. Okay, let's close in prayer. Lord God of creation, your majesty has been seen again. The colors of the rainbow speaking of your gift that you've given to us. That's your love signed with the rainbow. Lord, we thank you for blessing us so. We thank you for the glimpses you've given us of it, and we long to see it in all its glory, along with your face in eternity. Thank you that we know this is our home, that this will be our eternal future, that it will never grow dim, will never be cast out or darkness, will never be out in the back waiting for our turn, that it will be our joy. I can't even say moment by moment because there's no more moments, there's no more time but forever and ever. Oh, Lord, what a plan. You are so beyond our words. You are ineffable, and we praise you, and we thank you with hearts that are rejoicing forever and ever. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Okay, and anybody doesn't know that they're going to get there, see me. We'll point the way. We'll make it so clear you know you won't miss. <laughs> Because God guaranteed it, not Rochelle. <laughs>